What's up, people? We're back for another episode of Strange But True Music Facts, where I give you strange tidbits about singers, songs, bands, or generally anything about the music industry that's a bit strange. Mm. Just killing some time so I can hit you in the face with a little social media promotion and telling you not to forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you don't already know, my name is Tony, and I have a pretty diverse lineup of topics that I make videos about, so the chances that they'll be... Some videos and series on my channel, Keys to the Castle Music, that you might enjoy are pretty high. Unless you just can't stand me. And we all know that's a low probability because everyone loves me. Olivia Rodrigo fans don't like me too much right now. Now let's get to the strangeness. First, we start off with the Beatles. There's no escaping the Beatles, I guess, when it comes to music. Strange but true, music fact number one is that neither John Lennon... Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, or George Harrison could read or write music. None of them had any formal music education. You would think that this is strange for any musician or songwriter, but there are a lot of us, even the very popular and successful musicians, that don't read or write formal music notation. This is formal music notation. You've probably all seen it before. And if you're not a musician, it's probably all gibberish to you. It's gibberish to some musicians, too. It kind of looks like Morse code with all the lines and dots. I don't know if this is the correct notation from the Beatles as they played it because a lot of websites that put out sheet music will just put out a simple iteration of the sheet music. It won't be the correct one. A lot of the sheet music for the right hand of the piano will just be the vocal melody, so you have to find the right ones that have the actual music that they're playing on them. This pic shows you which notes are on which lines and which notes are in between each lines in the form of circles connected to other lines. So every space and every line is a note. If you want to know more, including what the time signatures mean or the different length of notes like this, etc., check it out for yourself. I can read and write it very minimally and very tediously. I mean, it's not incredibly hard to do it if you practice it, but I've never been like, oh, I need to study reading and writing music notation for five hours today. So I could do it if I really had to, but it would just take more effort, whereas someone like Quincy Jones is very proficient in it. He's been known to hear whole compositions in his head and just notate it on a music staff without any problem and without playing the music before he writes it all down. Other famous musicians who can't or couldn't read sheet music are Prince, Eric Clapton, and the guitar god Eddie Van Halen, just to name a few. The list is surprisingly long. There's a musician I've been following for years now named Sean Cheek that has his own way of music notation. And it's how I do my music notation when I'm writing a song as well. I've joked before that it's music notation for dummies, but however you get by is what it is. Sean just simply writes out the letters. So if you have trouble reading or writing music notation in the traditional way, give that a try and see if it suits you better. Just to go a little bit deeper, the letters make more sense to me because when you play the piano, you recognize the notes by placement of the keys on the piano and their note names. It's just 12 notes and they keep repeating up and down the keyboard. You don't look down and see circles on lines. So when you see the notes on paper in terms of circles and lines, you have to transfer those notes to the position on the piano. What I find most impressive are the people who can sight read music. That's when you fluently can read the notes on paper and play the music in time like how other people can read words quickly and efficiently. So even though it seems kind of strange that someone of the stature of the Beatles couldn't read and write music, I would say this is low on the strange meter and I would rank it maybe a 2 out of 10. Non-musicians and non-songwriters might think this is really strange and might rank it higher, but I promise it's really not that strange. Alright, that was kind of a long one because I just wanted to explain a little bit of it for people who don't know. The next strange but true music fact is that Barry Manilow, who is known for one of his hit songs called I Write the Songs, didn't write that song. I mean, it's not a big knock against Barry Manilow because he does write a lot of his own songs, but it's ironic that he didn't write that song. I'm not mad at singers who don't write their own songs and take credit for writing all of them. I mean, I'm not naming any names. But if every single writer wrote their own songs, then people like me who write songs and don't perform would never have a shot in hell of having our songs recorded. So everyone has a lane. Not that we have a great chance of it happening anyway because the industry seems to rotate songwriters over and over for numerous popular artists because they're making money with those people. So they're less likely to bring in new people. It's too big of a risk, I guess. You've probably heard of the songwriter that did write that song, though. It's Bruce Johnston from the Beach Boys. So once again, not incredibly strange, so I'd give it a 1 out of 10 based on how strange it is. Speaking of Beyonce, even though I didn't really mention her, in 2016, Mozart sold more CDs than she did. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is, of course, one of, if not the most prolific classical musicians in history. 
but he's been dead for 233 years, which makes this pretty strange. In 2016, Universal Music Group released a box set commemorating the 225th anniversary of his death called Mozart 225, the new complete edition. And let me tell you, when they say complete edition, it really is complete. The box set has 200 CDs included in it. I didn't know someone could even write that much music. Even if there were just five songs on each CD, that's obviously a thousand songs. I've written about 15 songs in the last 12 years or so. Quality over quantity, or at least that's what I'm telling myself. I looked it up because I kind of like to be somewhere in the ballpark with this stuff. Go figure. And I found out that Mozart wrote anywhere from 600 songs on the low end to 800 on the high end. It must be true because I saw it on Google. Still impressive, but the CDs must have different versions of songs on them that maybe have different instrumentation or something. Back to the record sales, though. This one is kind of stretching the truth a bit because the box set sold 6,250 copies globally, but they multiplied that by the 200 CDs that are included in the box set, making it a grand total of 1.25 million CD sales. This was all within five weeks of the box set being released. This is still very impressive because we all know CDs lost popularity in like the early 2000s. I couldn't find the CD sales for Beyonce's album Lemonade from that year, but it was obviously less than 1.25 million. And it could just be attributed to modern music fans spending their money on streaming and digital copies because let's face it, the people buying CDs in 2016 were most likely Mozart fans that were older than at least 40 years old. Now remember, this is CDs and not all media. Beyonce was still at the top in 2016 with 2.5 million total sales of an album in physical and digital sales, excluding streams with her album Lemonade. Just thought I would mention that before a Beyonce fan says something in the comments. Some of you are like sharks looking for some chum to attack once I get one thing wrong in one of 200 long form videos. It's definitely pretty strange that an artist from the 1700s outsold the biggest selling modern artist at the time with CD sales. So I'm going to give this a 4 out of 10 on the strange scale, even if it's a bit more nuanced than people might think. Britney fans won't like this next one. The British Navy supposedly used Britney Spears songs to scare off Somali pirates. An article from the British paper The Guardian says, Merchant Naval Officer Rachel Owens explained the tactics to Metro. Her songs were chosen by the security team because they thought the pirates would hate them most. These guys can't stand Western culture or music, making Britney's hits perfect. As soon as the pirates get a blast of Britney, they move on as quickly as they can. The songs that they used? Oops, I did it again and baby one more time. The Somali pirates must have seen the umbrella incident when her head was shaved. They don't want none of that. They're pirates. They're not stupid. This one is kind of weird to me for the obvious reasons. Can you hate a couple of songs or an artist or a genre of music so much that your love of plundering others for riches to the tune of up to $2 million a year by the most lucrative Somali pirates can make them turn ship and hightail it out of there? Apparently, the answer is yes. Or maybe it was just a big British warship that made them leave. I'm still going to rate this a 5 out of 10 on the strange scale simply because if it was me, I would sit through Britney songs all day every day to make $2 million a year. I mean, I do it sometimes now for nothing. Moving on to the next strange music fact. There's a group called the Rockin' 1000. It's a music project in Italy and was originally created in 2015 to ask the Foo Fighters to come visit the town of Cesena, Italy. The Rockin' 1000 was formed by marine geologist Fabio Zavignini, who was a big fan of the Foo Fighters. The group is comprised of a thousand plus musicians, including singers, guitarists, drummers, piano players, etc., etc. The idea for the group was apparently inspired by the movie School of Rock with Jack Black, where Black and Richard Linklater asked Led Zeppelin if they could use their song Immigrant Song in a video recorded on set. Zavignini invited all these different musicians to perform the Foo Fighters song Learn to Fly that's featured here in my video on my top 20 Foo Fighters songs. They figured if they created a group so massive that it gave them a small chance of having the Foo Fighters see it and perform a concert in their hometown, and it worked. Foo Fighters performed in Cesena, Italy the same year that the Rockin' 1000 formed and sent out their plea. Not only did the Rockin' 1000 succeed, but they've also gone on to perform popular rock songs all over the world, including in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 2022 in front of 30,000 audience members. The Rockin' 1000 are recognized as the biggest band in the world. Good luck getting paid in that band. I'm gonna rank this one a 4 out of 10 on the strange scale. It's kinda weird to go to these lengths to get the Foo Fighters' attention, but it's not as strange as bringing a llama into a recording studio like Michael Jackson did in one of my previous videos in this series. 
All right, what's going on here? None of these are incredibly strange to me. Maybe I'm just jaded and can't tell what's strange anymore, but these have all been pretty tame so far. This next one is actually believable from my viewpoint. Like I said, I'm just jaded and where some people see great singers or artists, I see the time that J-Lo sang on Saturday Night Live horribly, and they manually altered her pitch on our performance in the re-uploaded video to make it seem like she hit every note. You're not fooling me, big booty woman. If you've never heard it, search for it on Google or Twitter slash X. It's very eye-opening, especially for music fans that don't delve into all of the stuff like someone with a music channel on YouTube does. Anyway, so it seems now, today more than ever, it's the age of visuals over quality vocals. This was the case for the Pussycat Dolls with their debut album in 2005 called PCD. Lead singer Nicole Scherzinger said that she sang 95% of the Pussycat Dolls songs on their debut album by herself. That's despite them having numerous other members in the group. She said it was the reason why she was always front and center in the lead singer, because it just wasn't possible otherwise. Scherzinger is quoted as saying she probably did 95% of the singing on my own for the band's debut album PCD. Executive producer Ron Fair backed her up by saying Melody sang a bit here and there, but the records were Nicole, with the exception of an occasional ad lib. They were Nicole, it was her. Like I said, I can believe it. Put a group of six hot girls together and pop enthusiasts probably aren't going to care if they can all sing. The guys were just there for the eye candy anyway, and the girls all wish they could be them. You only need one of them to sing. Especially now more than ever when you could do anything with the vocals digitally. It's kind of weird though because most groups like that that I know about had all the members that could sing at least somewhat competently back then. Think of groups like the Backstreet Boys or NSYNC or other girl groups like SWV or En Vogue. Back in 2005, it was a little more unheard of for members in a group not at least being somewhat competent with singing. Today, I can completely believe that most members of a group can't necessarily sing. I would give this strange but true music fact maybe a 4 based on it being 2005. There's a Japanese girl group called AKB48 right now and they have 55 members. 37 official members and 18 trainees. The number fluctuates as girls graduate from the group aka age they produce music groups on a conveyor belt in asian countries i'm willing to bet that most of them are just there to look good and dance this next and final strange but true music fact is pretty strange and also pretty heartbreaking at the same time this one involves billy idol and the penthouse of the oriental hotel in bangkok thailand and when i read it i started laughing because it's just so outrageous and that kind of sounds like the title of a mystery novel or something like that. If you don't know, Billy Idol is a famous rock singer who was most popular in the 1980s with songs like White Wedding, Rebel Yell, Hot in the City, Eyes Without a Face, and Cradle of Love. He's also been known to be a bit of a wild man. Here's some backstory of what led to this epic bender. Billy was in a relationship with Perry Lister and they had a kid together in 1988 named Willem Wolf Broad. Broad is Billy Idol's real last name. Anyway, Billy destroyed his relationship with Lister because of his sex addiction with women, and I'm sure drugs didn't help either. He was even caught by Lister setting up a date with a woman he already had an affair with named Naomi through his son's baby monitor phone. This was all told by Idol himself in his memoir called Dancing With Myself from 2014. So Billy was caught between wanting to live the rock star lifestyle, but also having a relationship with Lister and his son. When that wasn't possible, a few weeks after breaking up with Lister, Idol felt so guilty that to soften the depression, or in all reality probably make it worse in the long haul, Idol decided to take a trip to Bangkok with his friend Harry Johnson. And yes, his real name is Harry Johnson. Idol said that they went there to have a, and I quote, holiday. I'm no psychologist, but that's probably not a great idea visiting the brothel and capital of the world when trying to get over ruining a relationship from being addicted. Well, Idol threw the party for himself at the penthouse of the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok, Thailand in 1989, and it went really well for about three weeks. Idol was so strung out on drugs that he was found in one of the hotel elevators opening and closing on him by Mel Gibson and his family. <laughs> this all sounds like a fever dream, but I promise it's true. You might be saying a rock star partying after a breakup? What's so strange? Well, if everything I just mentioned wasn't strange enough, after three weeks of partying himself into a zombie-like stupor, the hotel asked him to finally leave after he and his guests caused $250,000 worth of damage to the hotel. The damage and parade of constant prostitutes walking through the hotel to Idol's room took its toll on the staff. I read that Billy actually stood at three different hotels and caused damages to all of them. If you want to read the entire story that I saw, I'll include the link in the description down below. 
Upon being asked to leave the hotel, Ilo refused. I don't even know if he knew where he was. I guess it was his heaven. The hotel had to call the local military where a nurse sedated him and they carried him out on a stretcher. When Billy woke up, he was at the airport throwing up all over the place. He returned to LA to work on finishing his fourth album called Charmed Life. Surprisingly, Billy Idol is 68 years old and still alive today. I would give this an 8 out of 10 in terms of strangeness. Mel Gibson probably put it over the top. It all just seems like a surreal experience to all of us normal people that can't handle 100 Thai prostitutes and a metric shit ton of heroin and other drugs coursing through our systems. But to Idol, it just seemed like any other day in the life. I really hope he used protection, but in his state of mind, I highly doubt it. I wonder what Idol's blood looks like under a microscope now. Alright, so that's another episode of Strange But True Music Facts. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next week with the new one.